Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about the science behind the epigenetic research test that's done through my FSHD and through the Jones Lab here at UNR School of Medicine. Uh, so, we're going to be you know, a little more sciencey, but if you want to understand the basics of the test, how we perform the test, and go through it, well, this is for you. If you don't, skip on ahead and uh, get to the next section, which is learning about your report. But, but if you're yeah, if you're curious, you know, check this out. Okay, so first thing we want to remind everybody, this is a research grade test that we do through my FSHD and the Jones Lab at UNR. Okay, that means the result is not considered clinically relevant diagnosis, or it's not can actually even considered genetic test in the USA. All right. And also, this result may not meet clinical trial inclusion criteria, although this is a little sketchy. It may. It depends on the clinical trial. But if, you're, if the goal is to get into a clinical trial, um, you know, if our result comes back positive, it's quite possible you're going to have to go and take a CLIA-approved uh, test uh, to confirm the results that we have. And you know what? You should do that anyway. All right, so distinct epigenetics and FSHD. Uh, you know, if uh, in, in non-FSHD cases, you have these expanded uh, D4-Z4 arrays. They are epigenetically silenced. Uh, they are, it means they're heavily methylated. In FSHD, due to, to the contraction or the deletion in the repeats, um, which are recognized by the cell as being something they want to silence, I and mean, that's basically what's going on. The repeats are recognized, repetitive DNA, as this is kind of bad DNA. Let's silence it in somatic cells and it's going to be epigenetically silenced. The deletion of the repeats, now the cell doesn't actually recognize this as necessarily a repeat, and it's going to be on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. But is this something that should be silenced or not? And, you know, enough of the alleles are unsilenced and epigenetically on, so they're not methylated, and so that's FSHD1 when you have between 1 and 10 repeat units. Now in FSHD2, you still have a healthy or non-FSHD size repeat array on both of your chromosome 4s. So the signal that says turn me off is still there, but the off switch is broken. And that's due to mutations in other genes that regulate the epigenetic status of the region. And because it's the off switch that's broken, both alleles of chromosome 4 are actually epigenetically dysregulated. So you have methylated methylated is not FSHD, unmethylated methylated is FSHD1, and unmethylated unmethylated is FSHD2. Okay, so how are we going to do the test? So the first thing, oddly enough, we're going to do for an epigenetic analysis is a genetic test. So we're going to try to figure out if you are FSHD permissive, meaning do you have an FSHD permissive chromosome 4A or 4AL subtelomere? All right, and if you don't know why I'm talking about, you need to see the earlier part, <laughs> part one of the presentation. Okay, because FSHD um, is only associated with 4A and 4AL uh, subtelomeres. Okay, so we're going to check you out, and 25% of the world population is going to be 4B, 4B, meaning not permissive for FSHD, so you can't have FSHD if you're 4B, 4B. 75% of the world population, roughly, has at least one 4A or one 4AL, so is permissive for FSHD. So they have the potential to be FSHD. It doesn't mean you are FSHD. These are not pathogenic. Permissive, okay? So 25% of the world is non-permissive. 75% is permissive and potentially could be FSHD. All right, so what are we talking about? So we're going to go through, and this analysis is going to be called haplotyping. Okay, now what is a haplotype? Haplotype is a set of genetic elements, or genes, if you were to say, that are, tend to be inherited together. So the FSHD region has your D4Z4 array, your distal subtelomere that determines whether you're permissive or not permissive, and the upstream on the um, centromeric size are these simple sequence length polymorphisms that we're going to use to track chromosomes through your family and also um, to help us understand whether you're permissive or not. So the first thing we're going to do is a PCR, polymerase chain reaction, a genetic test that is specific for 4A, 4AL, and for B, and find out what are you. Do you have an A? an AL, a B, two A's, two AL's, AB, whatever. We'll figure out what your subtelomere is. 
we're also going to figure out what is your SSLP because your SSLP is often linked to your subtelomere. It's a haplotype. They're inherited together. What these are are, are really short repetitive sequences that are highly variable in the human population, but there are specific ones in this region that are associated with certain FSHD haplotypes. For example, 161, 161 often goes with 4A or 4AL. So you'll often see people are 4A161. And when we see that, we know that they're likely FSHD permissive, all right? Chromosome 4B often is 163 or 168. If we see someone is 4B, 4B and two 163s, 168s, we know that they're non-permissive. Okay, so this is all just putting it together to characterize your FSHD region. All right. So then um, the next test we're going to do is an epigenetic test, and the whole basis of this is epigenetic DNA sequencing. So there's four DNA bases: C, T, A, G. However, C can exist in a methylated form in humans. Okay, and so methyl C. It's kind of, sometimes they consider it like a fifth base. Methyl C in the context only of a CG dinucleotide. So here's actually the one to focus because this cartoon was not made correctly. Um, <laughs> CG in humans at least. And in other organisms you can have non-CPG. Non but in humans you only have CG dinucleotides that can be methylated or unmethylated. And the reason you do that is CG on one strand is CG. Remember DNA is directional. 5 prime to 3 prime here goes 5 prime to 3 prime here. G binds to C, C binds to G. So you have a bi, you have a symmetrically methylated region. Okay, and this is what we're assaying. So there's a, a, a chemical called sodium bisulfate. And what sodium bisulfite does is it converts C's that are not methylated, like this C right, um, this uh, C right here uh, is going to, is not methylated that becomes a T, which is actually read as a U, like right here, all right? C's that are methylated remain a C, all right? So it's a chemical modification of the, of the cytosine to make it into a uracil. And so when you do DNA sequencing, anytime you see a T, okay, because uh, where there should have been a C, you know that that C was unmethylated. Anytime you see a C where you should have seen a C, you know that C is methylated. So sodium bisulfide converts C's to T's while methyl C's remain C's. And by doing this, um, this uh, bisulfide sequencing, you're able to get the epigenetic state of the DNA. All right? So again, you see here you have CC, right? The C is unmethylated. That's a U. That is a T when you finally do the sequencing. The C was methylated. That stays a C after sodium bisulfide conversion and is a C in the sequencing when you do the methylation, um, when you do the sequencing analysis. And so, again, you're getting the, the, meth the base by base methylation sequence. Okay, and this is what we're doing with our epigenetic sequencing. All right, so where are the regions we're going to look at? Well, this gets, it seems very complicated, but remember you have chromosome 10 D4Z4s, chromosome 4 D4Z4s. All right, you can have a sub telomere that's a chromosome 10A, 10B, 4B, 4A, 4AL. There's also this funky one called 4A166, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, and FSHD1 and 2 are only associated with 4A and 4AL. So what are we going to do? Our first epigenetic assay is going to look at this region right here um, and see what is the epigenetic status for 4A and 4AL. All right, if you have them. If you don't have them, then it comes up blank. All right, then the next thing we're going to do, because this will tell us FSHD or not FSHD, right? Unmethylated, unmethylated, methylated, methylated. And then we're going to look at all the D4Z4 repeats. That's going to pick up chromosome 10, chromosome 4, even if it's a B, um, healthy chromosome 4s. We're going to pick everything up. And this will tell us FSHD1, FSHD2, or carrier of FSHD2. So this is the basis of the assay. This is kind of the flow chart. We're going to prepare your genomic DNA from saliva, from blood, from cells, pretty much from anything. Okay, bisulfide convert, do the 4A, BSSA, bisulfide sequencing for A, BSSL, bisulfide sequencing for L, and um, this is our first assay, and we're going to do this on everybody. Actually, even if you're BB, we're going to do these assays 
just to make sure that there's not something made a mistake, just to make sure there wasn't a mix up. And you know, we like to, you know, they should come up negative, no product. And you know, that's that's what happens. We always like to double check ourselves. It's a research test, but you know what? It's still somebody's results. Okay, so epigenetic assay one, if you have high levels of methylation, we know that's not FSHD. Low levels of methylation, different methods, it is, it is FSHD, or it's associated with FSHD, okay? Now, 4A and 4AL have different metrics, okay? 4AL is heavily methylated even in FSHD, so we actually have different metrics to look at. And this is important, and this is one of the several places where other methylation assays in the FSHD that are being attempted to be used for diagnostics get it wrong. Okay, you need to know to distinguish 4A from 4AL. All right, so then we're going to go through and do our next epigenetic assay. It's called, we call it BSSX, um, and we're actually going to do this even if you're not FSHD. Um, again, we do every assay, <laughs> um, but this flow would be if you're FSHD, are you FSHD1 or likely FSHD2? High levels of methylation across all the repeats is FSHD1. Low levels across the non-contracted array are FSHD2. All right, so that's kind of the flow. All right, so how accurate are these uh, results? Well, we have two different ways that we do the DNA sequencing, and both of them have shown to be greater than 99% accurate to identify FSHD versus not FSHD on genetically defined samples that we have in the lab. And we've actually, together, done more than 700 samples. And we'll show you the stats in a second. But the two methods are the old school Sanger sequencing method, and this was uh, invented by Sanger, and we've been using this since 2014 when we started doing this uh, technology on a research basis. We still use this today for individual samples. It's very quick. We can do this in two to three days. Um, it is more expensive for us, uh, so we tend not to do this, but occasionally if people have a doctor's appointment they want to bring their results to if they're just really freaking out, or if we need to get some quick confirmation, we, we, we still do this. It doesn't require any special equipment, just a PCR machine and very standard stuff in any lab. Um, the, the, more recently though, we've moved in 2021 to what's called next generation sequencing. Now others have published on this that are copying our technology, but we've been doing the next gen sequencing since 2021. In this, uh, you have a microchip where you can run batches of 70 to 96 or even more samples, depending on how many barcodes you have. Uh, this takes a little bit longer, but the reason it takes longer really is because we need to get 70 to 96 samples sent to the lab from all around the world. And, you know, we have, we can get anywhere between five samples to 20 samples in a week. You, know, you just never know. Uh, in the end, it costs the same amount to run one sample as 96 samples. Uh, we found a good cost break for us is around 70 samples because it's 50 to $60 per subject. And so this is cost effective, so it's worth waiting <laughs> to get this done. It also gets a lot more data. Uh, then you get in this, um, and you'll see this in a second. You do, however, need a next-gen sequencing machine. Now, we use a Thermo Fisher Gene Studio S5 with an Ion Chef to make the chip. We use this also because we do our own custom uh, neuromuscular disease array, and we have other reasons we use it. But you could use a different, cheaper NGS machine if you wanted to. But we use the Thermo Fisher machine. All right, so what's, uh, what, how does this method work? I'm just going to take you through a yeah, little bit of nerdy, uh, little kind of standard molecular biology. Sanger sequencing, we call this TA cloning. You do your bisulfide uh, BSSA PCR or BSSL or BSSX, and you get a PCR fragment that you are then going to clone into a plasmid. This is a little circular piece of DNA that can be propagated in E. coli. And you transform E. coli, and each one of these white colonies here contains... Um, a PCR fragment that originated from one chromosome from one cell in your cheek. Okay, so each one of these came from a different cell that we isolated from your cheek. You know, we got you know thousands and thousands of cells in your saliva sample, and each one has the same DNA sequence at chromosome four. Two chromosome fours, right? The very distal end is going to be the same sequence in both chromosome fours, but epigenetically they're going to be different. So we pick a, a series of these white colonies, 15 to 30 of them, and we have them sequenced. Again, each clone represents one chromosome 4 from one cell. They're all different, and we get the sequencing. And, and this is just shows you the difference, uh, color-based uh, capillary sequencing. All right, so what does it look like? Well, here is we're going to look at 56 CPGs. Remember I told you just a second ago that in humans, only Cs that are in a CG dinucleotide can be methylated. They can be methylated or unmethylated. 
Red represents the methylated state, right? That's going to be a C that remained a C because it was methylated. The blue is going to be an unmethylated C that was converted to a uracil and then red as a T. And so we're now going to be able to go through and see methylated, unmethylated, meth unmethylated, un, M, un, methylated, methylated, un, and then the whole thing. And so we get an epigenetic sequence here that shows 51.8% methylation. You know, so in those cartoons, I show it as all methylated or all unmethylated. This actually is what you get. You know, you get 51.8. Well, let's look at another one. Another chromosome also is 51.8. Okay, so hey, that's the same. Oh, but look, the methylation pattern is different. Even though it's the same overall level, it's different. What about the next one? Well, now we're all down to 50%. Down to 44.6%. 41%. 33%, oh, we're getting some different ones, right? Now if we actually look at 25 different chromosomes from 25 different cells, all chromosome fours in this individual, right? All Each left to right represents one unique chromosome four. Some are 3.6%, some are 51.8, and you have everything in between. So even though genetic DNA sequence is the same, the epigenetic sequence or the epigenetic state is different on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. And these are cells from your cheek, okay? So now we're going to go through, we had these stacked purposefully. <laughs> we didn't randomly get this order. We had them sequen stacked, you know, highest to lowest or lowest to highest, however you like to think about it. And um, now we're going to look at quartiles. So we're going to separate it into the first quartile. And you're going to see this on your port, Q1. It's going to tell us that's 12.5%. Q2 is 24%, that's this right here, 50 halfway through. Q3 is 33.9%, that's right here. Now this individual has one 4A and one 4B, so we only assay 4A. We don't care about 4B, so our assay is specific for 4A. And so that means that the single chromosome that they originally inherited from mom or dad, the 4A, okay, is between 3.6 and 51.8 methylated. Okay, so that's a huge difference in epigenetic state from the same chromosome, okay, just on different cells. And since it's uh, AB, we're going to look at Q2 halfway through, 24%. That is FSHD, probably a mild FSHD, quite honestly. Okay, then we're going to go through and we're going to do, we know that BSSA is FSHD, we're going to do BSSX and look at all the D4s, E4s. Now we're going to look at 59 different CPGs, and they're 42%. That's greater than 30%. Not FSHD2. This individual is FSHD1. Now let's go look at another individual. Same sort of thing, right? 1.8% to 69.6%, almost 70%. But actually looking at this, it looks like there's two kind of populations. You kind of have a low population, and you kind of have a high population. This person might be AA. So we're going to look at our quartiles again, first quartile. Second quartile, right here. Third quartile, right here. And this person is 4A, 4A. So now we're actually assaying both their short chromosome and their long chromosome. Now everybody's got a short and everyone's got a long. Just that both of your, your short and your long might both be healthy size, right? You could have a 20 repeat unit and a 50 repeat unit, okay? And the shorter one is going to be less than that, you know, but you also could have a 3 repeat unit and a 50. We don't really know. We, we don't care, actually, how long your repeat units are. All we care is epigenetic state. Since they're 4A, 4A, we're going to use first quartile, 17.9. That is definitely FSHD. So this individual, this is 4A, 4A. They have an FSHD chromosome and a non-FSHD chromosome, okay, a short and a long. They are both A. We're then going to do BSSX again. We get 53.4%. That is higher than 30%, not FSHD. Again, another case of FSHD1. Okay, so how, how accurate is this? We've done 318 genetically confirmed samples. 315 we got correct. Three we got incorrect. Uh, when we look at FSHD1 for FSHD2, we, we start to miss a couple of them. Um, you know, FSHD versus not FSHD is greater than 99%. FSHD1 versus FSHD2, they're, they're still FSHD. But every once in a while, due to some unusual circumstances, an FSHD1 case can look like FSHD2, and we get it wrong calling FSHD2. On rare occasions, we call somebody FSHD2, and they're actually FSHD1. 
Um, we can explain this you know, kind of later in, in the talk. So what about the next gen sequencing method? The same idea, we do BSSA, BSSL, and BSSX, but this time we're gonna add little special codes to each PCR product that are specific to the individual. All right, there's no cloning involved, there's no bacteria involved. We just get the PCR products that are labeled specifically. So if you are 4A, 4AL, we'll have three products for you. If you're BB, we only have one product for you. If you're AA, we'll only have one, we have two products, BSSA and X, okay. We then have these all in a tube, all right, and then uh, Takako makes a microchip on the Ion Chef, and they all get arrayed on a microchip. Um, again, we have the barcodes that do 96, but once we hit 70, people are waiting and we want to get the research results back to people. So we typically at least 70 at a time, all right. Then we put them onto the, the chip onto our genome sequencer, our Gene Studio S5, and you end up with all these barcoded uh, BSSA, BSSL, and BSSX products. Um, the computer sorts them all out, and then it's very important because we find all these interesting other sequences that other people are going to miss, right? So even though it's BSSA, you'll notice, well, there's a, a couple of other sequences that get read that are in there that are just kind of some garbage sequences. The computer sorts them out and gets rid of them. You know, PCR is a little bit dirty. Now, instead of 25 reads, 2,800 reads, 2,800 different chromosomes. And what we do, the computer actually sorts out based on little sequence variations to know that all of these are unique. All right, so all of these assay are assaying 2,800 different cells from your cheek. All right, the low, low level is 12% methylation. The high level is 100% methylation. This person's AB, so even with a single chromosome A, you can be between 12 and 100, okay? I mean, that's what the kind of data that this kind of depth gets you. Now, because of that, they're actually, though, we know we take Q2, 56.52, that is not FSHD, right? And then if we're going to look at BSSX, it confirms that it's still not FSHD, and it's definitely not FSHD too. But think about this range that people have. You think, okay, this is a healthy individual range. Everybody's a little bit FSHD. All right, now let's look at this case down here. We're going to look at, this is also 4A, 4B. So what's the range here? Well, now you see a lot of zeros, right? A lot of zeros coming in. And the maximum range, though, still is almost 80%, okay? You know, 95%, 90%, you actually, you know, 25% or more are healthy epigenetic states, kind of, of your of the chromosome. But on average, right, here at Q2, it's not really an average, but at the second quartile, it's 24%. That is FSHD. And we look at the BSSX, that's FSHD1. All right. And this time we rod 4,317 different chromosomes to get this level of depth. Okay, here are 6,405 different uh, D4-Z4 repeats, not chromosomes, because now this is only specific to each repeat, right? So that's fewer chromosomes. All right, what does it look like? Here's kind of our heat maps. Remember, blue is unmethylated, red is methylated, and uh, both individuals here are A, B, and these are the ones that we just showed. So the not FSHD, you see a lot more red, but you still see some blue. And in the FSHD, you see a lot more blue, but there's still some red. And this is actually what you are. This is the epigenetic variability that makes you different from your sibling or from your parent or from your child that has FSHD, right? You are epi, you have a unique epigenetic signature. This is only a hundred cells that were randomly chosen by the computer. But think about this. You are the trillions of cells that make you, you, they each have, they have the same DNA sequence of the region, but each one has their different. You have some that are a hundred percent unmethylated and very on, but you have some that are methylated and very off. And this in this mixture, and what, what what muscles are these in, and what and how you know how do these get individually activated? Everybody's epigenetically different. Even if you have the same numbers, the patterns are going to be different. The percentages are going to be different on an individual basis. Identical twins are different. All right, and this is the kind of data you get from the next gen sequencing data when you assay it correctly. All right, this is that fifty percent mark, and just see your fifty percent um, FSHD. 50% healthy, right, right here. It's not really, you know, it's really a second quartile mark. Very clear that we're just assaying at this point. You get the non-FSHD versus FSHD. So how many have we done? We've done 463 genetically confirmed samples. Um, we've been correct 459 times, 
And honestly, these four incorrect ones are pretty dang close to being correct. We'll get to that in a second. So um, again, FSHD1 versus FSHD2 is a little bit more complicated because it's just it's unusual, but it's still FSHD. Right, we're getting it right that it's FSHD. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two. Most of the time, we still get that right. Still greater than ninety-five percent of the time. Uh, but you know, that's it's it is a little bit of a hole in the system. All right. So what happens when you get a conflicting result? Right. If you're clinically FSHD and came to us for your research test result, and came back and we said yes, you are epigenetically FSHD. Go ahead and get your clinically approved test. And then you go get your test and it comes back negative for FSHD1 and negative for FSHD2. What's going on? Well, again, it turns out that, and this has happened several times, um, there are two possibilities. Well, there's three possibilities. One, we're just we're wrong and we don't understand why. That is actually the rarest of all possibility. Um, it could be a chromosome 10 rearrangement, right? That could be one. And we're picking it up. And we're able to figure that out because on your genetic test, you'll have a short uh, chromosome 10. But what else could it be? Well, it turns out that if you have between 1 and 14 repeat units, you, by definition, the testing agency will come back and tell you you are not F, you're negative for FSHD1. You have 11 repeat units. That's not FSHD, right? Your FSHD2 methylation levels might not be low enough to be FSHD2. You don't have an SMCHD1 mutation. So you don't fit any of the um, accepted criteria for FSHD, not one or two, but you're epigenetically FSHD in this situation, I would make the case that that actually should be considered FSHD, right? Because by definition, these situations are FSHD1, nine repeat units, 10 repeat units with a 4A, but as soon as you're 11 repeat units, you're not considered FSHD, even if you're clinically FSHD, and even if you're epigenetically FSHD, right? I believe it should be this situation where epigenetic FSHD and clinical FSHD go hand in hand. That should be considered FSHD. Um, these situations here, you know, for maybe genetic counseling, they can be considered FSHD. You know, it, it gets complicated when you're thinking about inheritance and passing it on. But at least for therapy, for determining what the individual has um, as a defined, confirmed disease and being able to get into a clinical trial and being able to get therapies when they're available. I believe all of these situations should be included. All right, well, that's how the testing works. Now you don't know the, the nuts and bolts behind it all, the magic, you know, it's for epigenetic uh, research testing. Now remember, it is a research test. And there are two, while there's two different ways to do the sequencing, the end result is the same. Uh, both are greater than 99% accurate when compared against uh, known uh, controls that are genetically confirmed for FSHD1, FSHD2, and not FSHD. doesn't mean every once in a while that uh, we get it wrong, we don't fully understand, we try to solve every single case, which is why it's going to be important to get things confirmed uh, by uh, you know a CLIA certified test in a CLIA certified lab. But if you have any questions, as always, send me an email, peterjones at med.unr.edu, and I'm happy to answer any questions about our testing, any questions about uh, FSHD in general, therapeutics going forward, or, you know, and I'll go always, uh, you know, happy to go over your report with you, with your family, genetic counselor, clinician, whoever. We just, we're, we're here to help. So whatever we can do to make this journey a little bit easier for you, because we know it's tough. But don't worry, you know, we're getting there. We are actually getting there. The field is moving. And one of the reasons we uh, are doing this testing is because I firmly believe that we're going to be able to provide results that say, hey, you know what, it looks like FSHD, but guess what? Good news, there's something we can do about it. That day's coming soon. All right.